Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am in a ditch. Up until this point in the course, we've kind of been jumping around a lot. We started out, well, first of all, trying to figure out what an operating system is. We moved on to talking about processes, so we kind of considered this to be the granular unit of work on an operating system. Then we jumped kind of wildly to looking at threads, and we learned that Threads themselves are an even more granular method of breaking down work. Last week, we spent some time looking at inter-process communications. The idea here was that we were trying to overcome some of the issues that processes have in relationship to threads. Threads can read and write from each other's memory. Processes can't. So we need some kind of mechanism for processes to communicate with each other. Some of those mechanisms for communication were better than others. So signals, for example, are pretty limited. They're simple, but they're limited. Pipes require a little bit more work on our part, but they give us the ability to do significantly more complex kinds of communication between processes. This week, we are actually jumping back to just after we learned about processes in the order of the textbook. And this week we're looking at scheduling. You may want to take the time to go back and remind yourself about this idea of direct execution. You may want to go back and remind yourself about this idea of context switching and mode switching and how the hardware and software have to work together to accomplish these things. I'm going to start talking about multi-level feedback cues, MLFQ. This is chapter 8 in our textbook, and it kind of assumes that you've already taken the time to read through chapter 7, which is just giving us the basic idea of scheduling and some of the algorithms that are available for scheduling processes and tasks on an operating system. The algorithms that you looked at so far are they're fine, they're, they're functional, they work, they have been used historically, but they're all limited in that they rely on, at least in terms of what we're doing now with operating systems, they all rely on these unrealistic assumptions about tasks and work. So for example, they all rely on the operating system or the scheduler knowing how long a job will take. Or some of them, for example, rely on the scheduler, assuming that they all take the same amount of time. And up until the very end of that chapter, we were assuming that none of the tasks did I.O. So all of those scheduling algorithms, while, while they work, while they're functional, while they have been used in the past, they really don't account for what processes actually look like. So we can't possibly know how long a process is going to take to execute. You know, uh, Alan Turing would like to have a word with you if you are able to figure that out. None of our processes are going to take the same amount of time, and certainly almost all of our processes are going to need to do I.O. at some point or another. The multi-level feedback queue is a scheduling algorithm, so it's kind of a combination of data structure and algorithm that's going to try and address the issues that we came up with in the last chapter. So basically, the goal for this algorithm is to minimize turnaround time. So we want to do our best to get jobs finished as close to the time as when they were submitted for work. And we want to try and optimize responsiveness, so or minimize response time. So basically, we want to make sure that things that are interactive processes, so where you are the user, you're sitting there typing at the keyboard, you're moving your cursor around, we want to make sure that it feels like that process is actually reacting to the things that you're doing with it. And both of these are the responsibility of the scheduler. So making sure that processes are able to get onto the CPU so it seems like they are responsive to your input is the job of the scheduler. Our goal, again, is to do this under real conditions, under real kinds of workloads. So we're no longer going to make these assumptions about no I.O. We're no longer going to make these assumptions about tasks taking exactly the same amount of time. And we're no longer going to make this assumption that we know how long a task is going to take before it finishes. We're going to start actually by taking a look at figure 8.1.
which is a visualization of a multi-level feedback cue. A multi-level feedback cue, by its very name, implies that it is a collection of cues. It's a list of cues. This is the easiest way to think about this. So it's a list of cues in that a list implies order. There is an order to the cues that we have, and there are many of them. So there are cues in this system. Each of the cues that we have in this system has a priority that's attached to it. In this figure, we can kind of look at this as say, and say that index one in our list, uh, this is a one based list, index one in our list has the lowest priority, index eight has the highest priority in this list of cues that we've got. The way that the multi-level feedback cue algorithm works now, so that's the data structure, the way that the algorithm works, how we're actually going to put tasks into this queue and how we're going to choose which task gets to run kind of starts with two simple rules. The rules are basically considering two processes, A and B. Rule number one says, if the priority for A is greater than B, then A gets to go. That's it. And B doesn't work. It doesn't run. Rule number two says, if you have two tasks that are the same priority, so task A and task B are in the same queue in this multi-level feedback queue, then we run them in round robin. So they each get to take turns occupying the processor. This is simple. It's straightforward. We have this data structure that shows us physically what priority processes have. And now we've got two rules to run our algorithm to choose which process or which task gets to start or come off of that queue and actually run in the processor. This is fine, but we kind of have to figure out how do we actually assign priorities to tasks. So how do we decide which queue to put this in? Figure 8.1 here is showing four different tasks where A and B have the highest priority C has kind of a mid-level priority and D has the lowest priority. How do we make that decision? How do we decide which queue to put tasks in? We can't really just let the user do it. The way that the multi-level feedback queue algorithm works is that we're going to assign a default priority to task. So as a task enters the system, we're receiving a new task. There the fork system call has been made. We are going to assign a default priority to a task. When that task comes in, we're going to assign a default priority and we're going to change the priority at runtime. So as this task is living within this multi-level set of queues, we're going to make observations about it and then we're going to adjust the priority. So we're going to change the priority of that task as it proceeds with its normal execution and as we schedule it on the processor. So what kinds of behaviors are we going to look at here? What are we going to make observations about in terms of this process? One of the things that we can do is just take a look at the, the IO behavior. We actually started to do this in the last chapter. When a process makes a system call and it asks to do IO, then we take it off the processor and that gives us an opportunity to schedule another task on the processor. We can specialize on that though. A job that does a lot of I.O. on very specific devices, so thinking about things like your keyboard or thinking about things like your mouse, a job or a task that does I.O. on those specific devices is probably an interactive process. It's probably an interactive process, and that means that it should be a higher priority process. We want to make sure that jobs that are interactive feel responsive. We want to minimize that response time. So making jobs that are interactive high priority means that they will always get to run on the processor. If they have the highest priority, they will always get to run on the processor on top of the ones that have lower priority. Jobs that don't do any I.O., so say, for example, you're computing pi, so something that's just spinning around in a loop approximating pi, 
really doesn't do any I.O., they're probably not interactive jobs. And that means that we can take those jobs and we can lower their priority. We don't need to minimize response time for a process that never does interaction with the user. We can look at these jobs. If they do a lot of I.O. with specific devices, we can make them have high priority. And if they don't do a lot of I.O. at all, we can make them have lower priority. So far, this is fine. We can assign tasks a priority. We can assign them a default priority when they enter the system, or we can assign them a priority as they're running through the system. Let's take a look at figure 8.1 again. The problem right now with this specific situation is if we have these four tasks, A, B, C, and D, the two rules that we've got, if a process has a higher priority than another process, then the process with the higher priority gets to run. If the process has the same priority as another process, then they get to run in round robin. In this specific example, if processes A and B are long running tasks, then C and D will never get the chance to be scheduled. With those two rules that we've got, the situation is basically A and B will sit there doing round robin on the processor that we have, and then C and D never get a chance to be scheduled until those two tasks have completed. If we keep doing this, then we're kind of back in that same state that we were in earlier. We just run jobs effectively until completion at this point. A and B are just gonna keep getting the processor over and over and over again. They'll keep getting scheduled and effectively will run to completion until they are no longer in the system. So they make that exit system call. We remove them from this set of multi-level queues and only at that point would C and D start to get executed. And even then in figure 8.1 specifically, C would execute to completion and then D would execute to completion. This is not ideal. This is really just the same thing that we had before, but more complicated than it was before. So our first thing to try and do is change the priority of processes at runtime. We can't just set the priority of a job and leave it in that same priority state, or we degenerate back to running jobs to completion. What we want to do here now is instead of running a job to completion, putting it in high priority and leaving it in high priority, what we want to do is pick a default value for a process and then adjust its priority at runtime. So again, we're going to make observations about processes while they're running, and then we're going to adjust the priority that they have based upon our observation of their behavior. We're going to add three new rules to our system to try and accomplish this. We're going to keep those same two rules that we had. So jobs that have a higher priority get to run sooner or get to run over top of ones that have a lower priority. And we're going to keep that rule. We're going to have jobs running at the same priority in a round robin fashion. But now we're going to add three new rules. Rule three is when a job enters the system, it's placed at the highest priority. So by default, when we get a new job, all jobs are the highest possible priority in the system. Based upon our observations of what these jobs do now, we're going to adjust their priority. So rule 4A here is if a job uses up an entire time slice while running, its priority is reduced. So time slice here, just to remind you, we've got that timer interrupt, it fires every so often. We do mode switching and then context switching. That's the dispatcher part of things. The scheduler has to decide which one to switch to. So if a job uses up its entire time slice, it's assigned to the processor and it runs until the timer, the, the timer interrupt fires. It's used up its entire time slice. If that happens, then we reduce its priority. Rule 4B says, if a job gives up the CPU before its time slice is complete, then it stays at the same priority level. If a job uses up its entire time slice before giving up the processor, so it, it's interrupted by the timer, that implies that it's never made a system call. That implies that it's never done any I.O. and it can't have done any I.O. on a keyboard or a mouse. If a job does give up the processor, so it makes a system call, 
then that implies that it is doing some kind of I.O. or something that's requiring the operating system to interfere. Let's take a look at a couple of examples to see how different kinds of processes are going to behave in this system. The first one is a single long running job. So basically the idea here is that we're going to have one job in the scheduler. There will be exactly one task in the scheduler and it's a long running job. So let's look at figure 8.2. If we have a single long running job over time, the bottom X axis here is the, the time, the, the bottom X axis is time and the, and the Y axis is the queue that it's currently in at that time. If we have a single long running process over time that never does any IO, it starts at the highest priority in Q2. And then after its time slice finishes, we reduce its priority. So it's used up its entire time slice. It was interrupted by the timer. The operating system takes over. It says, okay, this process used this whole time slice. Let's lower its priority. Then we switch back to the process. It runs through its entire time slice. We do the timer interrupt, the operating system takes over, it says, okay, it used the whole time slice, let's lower its priority. Now it's in the lowest priority. At this point, there is no lower priority, so that task just stays running. There's still going to be interrupt timers, but because this is the only job in the system, it's always going to get scheduled back by the scheduler. This seems fine. Uh, we're lowering the priority of this process over time, but it's basically just running to completion. So let's add another job to this situation. Figure 8.3 now is showing an interactive job. We've got the long running job, which is in black, and then we've in inserted a shorter task that is going to uh, actually do some kind of IO. So starting at the left at time point zero, Task one, the long running job, starts at the highest priority queue. It uses its full time slice. It switches down to, to, to queue one, so priority one. It uses its full time slice and switches down to the lowest priority. At about time point 100, this new task is inserted to the system. So this new task is inserted into the queue, but it's inserted at the high, highest priority. So that was one of our rules. We insert new tasks at the highest priority level. This job is going to run for its entire time slice. It will be interrupted by the timer. It has used its entire time slice, so its process priority is reduced. But at this point, it's still higher priority than the first task. So it's going to run to completion now, it's going to finish, and then at that point, only at that point, once it's finished, does the first process get back onto the processor again. This is actually pretty good. We're getting the characteristics of shortest job first, so we're minimizing turnaround time here. The short task was added to the system and it finished fairly quickly compared to the long running task. So we're, we're effectively minimizing turnaround time here. Even better, this multi-level feedback queue is doing this without even knowing that the second task is shorter than the first task. It doesn't know how long they're going to run, but it effectively minimizes the turnaround time without having to have that information in the first place. The basic idea here is that the multi-level feedback queue makes an assumption that all tasks are short tasks to begin with. It puts them all in this high priority queue and assumes that they're going to be quick. If they're not very quick, it will lower their priority over time. Jobs that are actually short are going to finish quickly because they're not going to have enough time in the system to have their priority lowered very much compared to other long running jobs in the system, which will be in the system for long enough to have their priorities lowered over a long period of time. The problem with this is that neither of these two processes actually do any I.O. In both cases, they are running to completion before they terminate. In both cases, they're using their complete time slice before they're interrupted by the timer. They're not actually making any system calls to do I.O. So let's add a new task that does I.O. This is figure 8.4 now. At the beginning of this whole thing, so at time point zero, at the left of the diagram, task one, which is the black task, is inserted. It runs for its entire time slice. It's interrupted by the timer. 
So it's used its entire time slice. So MLFQ is going to reduce its priority. It again uses its entire time slice before it's interrupted by the timer. So it's reduced in priority again. And then at around time 50, this new task is inserted. But this new task only does a tiny little bit of work before it yields the processor by doing some kind of system call, doing some kind of IO. Once that happens, that IO task will be taken off of the processor and it will permit the other process to run. So that task does IO, it's kind of blocked, and now the other task that's really low priority will get to run. The effect here is that we've got these two processes, they are now happening kind of in round robin. When that process that does the IO has its IO uh, request satisfied, it will be scheduled again once that long running job has been interrupted by the timer. So using these four rules now, basically what we've got is minimizing turnaround time. We're basically doing shortest job first without having to know how long processes are going to take. But now we're also minimizing response time. We're making sure that jobs that do IO are going to get back on the processor as often as they need to. This is, this is great. This is really great because we've taken those unrealistic assumptions out. We've taken all of them out and we've got this functioning system. Scheduling is done. There are actually three problems with our current setup. First is that if we have too many interactive tasks, those interactive tasks will always stay at the highest priority level. The interactive tasks that are staying at the highest priority level, if we have too many of them, enough of them that between all of them, yielding the processor will always result in another high priority task being scheduled, we will effectively be starving those lower, lower priority tasks of the CPU. They will never get a chance to run. This isn't an issue when we only have two tasks in the system like we did in figure 8.4. But if we have, for example, a thousand high priority tasks and one long running task, we've basically got this issue where all of the high priority tasks are just getting a round robin chance on the CPU and we're starving that low priority task. Another issue is that it's possible to game our system. A malicious actor on our system could basically take advantage of this fact that using up only some of a time slice will result in you staying in the highest priority level. You could craft a process, craft a program that basically runs up until 99% of your time slice and then does some kind of an IO request, does some kind of a system call. If you can manage to do that with this current set of rules, that means that you're just going to get scheduled again immediately. You give up your time slice and by giving up your time slice, you're telling this algorithm, I'm going to stay on the highest priority. So it's possible for this to happen. We can mine bitcoins and we can just sometimes do these IO requests that make us stay in the highest priority queue. Another problem and the final problem that we have here is, what if the observed behavior that we see changes over time? So what if we have a long running task where in the middle of its process, it becomes interactive? That process then, if it becomes interactive a long time into its execution, when it's already had its priority lowered to the bottom, it's not going to get raised to the top again to improve response time. So our response times will be low if we put these long running tasks into the bottom priority where they eventually do some kind of interactive task. Let's take a look now at section 8.3 where we're going to try and make changes to the priority even after we've lowered them. The basic problem that we've got is that as we're pushing these tasks into lower priority queues, they never get the chance to go back up in priority. The idea here is basically every once in a while, let's just give them a bit of a boost. Let's change the priority of a low priority task to be high priority. So we're gonna add another rule. This is rule number five. 
After some time period S, move all the jobs in the system to the topmost Q. With this new rule, remember that all the other rules that we have, one, two, three, four A and four B are all still in effect. We had three problems. Too many interactive tasks cause starvation for the lower uh, non-interactive tasks. It's possible to game the scheduler and processes that are long running can change their behavior over time. Boosting the priority of processes, of all processes in the system, every once in a while solves two of these problems. Processes cannot be starved in the system if we boost the priority of all processes every once in a while. Boosting the priority of all processes every once in a while effectively means that even the low priority long running tasks will be in the high priority queue sometimes. That means that they're going to be in the set of rules that are saying, if two tasks have the same priority, then we should run those tasks in round robin. Those low priority tasks eventually get boosted to the top again. The other thing that this solves is not being able to predict the behavior of long running tasks when that behavior changes. If a long running task's behavior changes at runtime, somewhere in the middle, after it's been put into the low priority queue, when it gets boosted to the high priority queue, it may stay in the high priority queue because it will do giving up its time slice before the time slice is finished. So before that timer interrupt fires. So that's great. That solves two of our problems. Let's take a look at figure 8.5 here that visualizes this. On the left side, we've got no boosting of priority and we've got three tasks. Two of them are interactive. They're giving up their time slice before the time slice is finished. And one of them is that longer running task. On the very left here at time point zero, we insert that task to the highest priority queue. It uses up its entire time slice. The timer interrupt fires it gets reduced in priority. It uses up an entire time slice, the timer interrupt fires, it's reduced in priority. Time 100 now, we've got these two new interactive tasks that get inserted to the highest priority queue, and those two tasks now run in round robin. They never stop, they never finish their time slice before they do some kind of system call. So they starve out that other task. It never gets a chance to get back on the processor. On the right side now, we still do the same thing with this first task. We insert it into the high priority queue and then lower its priority over time based on it using up its entire time slice. But now at time point 100, when we insert these two new tasks and they run in round robin doing these system calls every once in a while, we eventually boost this other task up to the highest priority. And so it gets a chance to run in the processor. It becomes part of that round robin of all of those tasks that have the same priority. So what do we set S to? I don't know. It kind of depends. It kind of depends on the tasks that you've got, the kinds of tasks that you have in your system. We still have a problem here. The problem is that we can still game the system. We can still have these Bitcoin miners that use up most of their time slice and then just stay in the highest priority queue. So priority boosting isn't really preventing that from happening. If it manages to stay in the highest priority queue, it will always be in the highest priority queue. So if it uses up most of its time slice and then does a system call to make it seem like, it be, like it's interactive and it should stay in the highest priority queue, it will stay in the highest priority queue. So, what we're going to do is make some changes to the rules that we had before. We had rule 3, 4A, and 4B. Rule 3 was when a job enters the system, it's placed at the highest priority. We'll keep that rule. But what we're going to do is change rules 4A and 4B. Rule 4A was if a job uses its entire time slice, then what we're going to do is reduce its priority. Rule 4B was if a job gives up the CPU before its time slices up, then it just stays at the same level. We're gonna change this now to rule four. Rule four says, 
Once a job uses up its time allotment at a given level, regardless of how many times it has given up the CPU, its priority is reduced. The difference between rules 4A and 4B and this new rule 4 is that we're keeping track of how much time a process has used before it gave up access to the CPU. Rules 4A and 4B don't care. They just say, if you do not use your whole time slice, you can have it back again and you can stay at the same priority level. Rule 4 says, keep track of how much time is being used before the time slice is given up and change adjust priority based upon that. So basically, we're keeping track of how long a process is running on the CPU before it gives up access to the CPU. Interestingly enough, this is something that you can get out of System Tap. Linux is keeping track of how much time a processor is using uh, as it's executing, so how many cycles it's using as it's executing. And the basic idea here now is that each process has a certain amount of time that it's permitted to use before it gets kicked out of that priority level that it's at right now. Let's take a look at figure 8.6 here. In figure 8.6, we've got a pretty similar setup to what we had before. We've got a task being inserted into the highest priority queue. It uses up its time slice, it gets lowered. It uses up its time slice, it gets lowered. Eventually what happens is we've got this bad actor that's starting to run in the system. And at around time point, I don't know, 75, it gets inserted into the highest priority queue. When it's in that highest priority queue, it uses up most of a time slice, and then it gives up the processor. And that allows the low priority task to run, but then we just go back immediately to the high priority task. And we keep doing this over and over and over again. Now what we're doing is, on the right side, we've got the same kind of setup, but at around time point 75, that new task enters the system, it uses up a bunch of time, and then it does I.O. We allow the lower task to start running again after it does that I.O. We put the high priority task back on, but then we stop it right away. But then we almost immediately lower its process priority. It's used up the amount of time that it was given. Before, we didn't care how long it used up. We just put it back in the high priority queue. Now we're saying you've used up enough time, so we're gonna lower your priority. Does this jo affect jobs that are not being malicious and they just happen to behave like this? Well, yeah, sort of, but it's probably not using much of their time slice. Interactive jobs anyway are probably not using much of their time slice before they do some kind of IO operation and block. The other thing to remember is that this new rule four is still part of this entire set of rules that we've got. So we're still doing priority boosting. If uh, an interactive task does get pushed down into lower priority queues, it will eventually be pushed back to the top again. So we've got basically what's a fully functioning system now. This data structure and these five rules are effectively allowing us to have a scheduler with priority that minimizes turnaround time and minimizes response times. It makes interactive systems feel responsive. We still have some issues though. And the main issues that we have here are, well, how do we choose how many queues to have in this system? How do we choose how long to wait before we boost the priority of a task? How do we choose how long a time slice should be? What I want you to think is that this scheduling algorithm is kind of like a function. And the function is basically given a set of tasks and some parameters, which are things like how long do I wait for a task to have a time slice? How long do I wait before boosting all priorities? How many queues should I have in the system? Imagine this as a this scheduling algorithm as a function. And it takes these values as parameters. Building on this, it's it's actually even reasonable now to have parameters that are basically per queue parameters. So let's say figure 8.7 here, we have three different queues. We might want to make the highest priority queues have really small time slices. We might want to make the lowest priority queues have fairly long time slices. These are all things that can be configured in the system that we're trying to build with this multi-level feedback queue. As you might imagine, 
providing options for all of these different settings is not really trivial. The authors describe in the textbook methods that can be used in operating systems like Solaris, which is not really around anymore, and FreeBSD. But the basic idea is that they are fairly complicated to configure. That's the basic idea is that they're fairly complicated to configure. On top of all that, real schedulers in real operating systems have other kinds of things that they need to know about beyond what we've just talked about. There may be different kinds of processes, different classifications of processes. So for example, the processes that the operating system itself is running may need to have higher priority than any user level process. So a process on the operating system side that's doing something like memory management should have way higher priority than even the highest priority interactive task that we could have on the user side. Real schedulers can have configuration options to tune them, but they can also allow users at runtime to give some advice about how processes should be scheduled. On Linux systems, this is referred to as the niceness of a process. If your process is very nice, that means that you don't care that much about it being scheduled very highly, even if it does appear to be an interactive process. So the scheduler can take that advice and lower it if, if, if it makes sense to lower it based upon the advice that you as the user has given it. A quick summary of all this is, we're looking at the multi-level feedback queue. Multi-level queue here is the data structure. We've got a list of queues and the algorithm here is changing the priority of tasks, moving tasks between the queues based upon the observations that we're making about those tasks at runtime. The rules that we have for this system that affect how those tasks live in the data structure are rule one, if the priority of one task is higher than another, then the higher priority task gets to run. If we have tasks that have the same priority, they should be run in round robin. When any task enters the system, it enters at the highest priority level. Once a job uses up the amount of time that it is given to use the CPU, it's lowered in priority. And every once in a while, we will boost the priority of all tasks in the system. This allows us to have a system that doesn't rely on the unrealistic assumptions that we made about processes in the last chapter. And it lets us have the benefits of minimizing response time and minimizing turnaround time for tasks that are short running, even without knowing how long tasks are going to take before they start. So that's it for multi-level feedback cues. Thanks for listening and I'll see you soon.